Okay, so I am Emily Thiel, and I am a junior undergraduate student here at Syracuse University. I study health and exercise science and nutrition in the Falk College of Sport and Human Dynamics. And I am working with Dr. Kim for this conference. And the journal article that I will be critiquing is titled Physical Activity and Screen Time Among Youth with Autism, a Longitudinal Analysis from 9 to 18 Years. So this study focuses on autism spectrum disorder. So being a spectrum disorder, children that exhibit um, autism will have different capabilities. They can range from totally social, um, verbal, they can mobilize, they're able to participate in sports, in games, in relationships. And then you may have other children on the other end of the spectrum who are nonverbal, who have challenges with mobility and movement and socializing skills and communication. So it is a biologically based neurodevelopmental disorder. And like I said, it does have an effect on behavior, social and communication skills. So the severity, children will not all exhibit the same symptoms. The severity does vary. They will have limited forms of behavior in a different setting. So school, work, home, depending who they're around, they will have limited forms of behavior, and they also might have repetitive forms of behavior. So they get into a routine of something that they like to do, and they will feel comfortable doing this routine and only this routine. So change can be scary. It impacts the nervous system. So this is why they may have issues with mobility, um, things like running, walking, um, hand movements, things like that, things that are necessary for sport and physical activity. So this study broke down physical activity into two groups moderate to vigorous physical activity and light physical activity. So for this study, Dahlgren et al. assessed not only physical activity, but screen time as well. And screen time was broken down into television and video games, not the type of television or the type of video game, just television and video games. And for physical activity levels, moderate to vigorous physical activity would be anything considered hard enough to cause heavy breathing and an increased heart rate. So this could be going for a run, a soccer game, anything that really just made them breathe heavy. And then light physical activity would be going for a walk or um, PE class or playing um, some catch with a friend. So this was exercise that, you know, was exercise, got you moving, but it was not heavy enough to cause heavy breathing or substantially increase the heart rate. So autism spectrum disorder has been correlated with higher levels of screen time and lower levels of physical activity. And why do we care about this? This may have a correlation to the higher prevalence of negative health outcomes in those with autism spectrum disorder. And children with autism spectrum disorder are more likely to have a shortened lifespan compared to neurotypical children. And this may be due to the fact that they spend less time on physical activity and more time on screen time. So they are more likely for comorbidities. So the purpose of this article, he aimed to evaluate the screen time, light and moderate to vigorous activity in children compared to neurotypical and autistic children. And by doing this, Dahlgren et al. hoped to distinguish certain individuals who may be at a higher risk for those comorbidities later in life. Um, like I said, activity, the more physical activity, the higher longevity chances of life. Um, the more screen time, the more that decreases. So he aimed to evaluate if there was truly a difference between children with autism and children who are neurotypical. So this was given in child and caregiver reported surveys. So an interviewer would ask questions to the guardian or the child and the amount of children decreased with each wave. There were three waves. So it was a longitudinal analysis. So it started at age nine, that was wave one. And then wave two, would be when the children were about 13. And then wave three would be when the children were 17 or 18 years of age. And the goal was to have the same children and see how their hobbies and activities changed within that timeline. So 8,568 children were surveyed at wave one and this decreased to 6,216 by wave three. They further decreased this large number by comparing the autism spectrum disorder children and the neurotypical children with their backgrounds, their 
income, their gender, their household size, and they wanted to really get the most similar children who their only differences were their diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder to truly see if that was a causing factor in the limiting amount of physical activity. So those with autism spectrum disorder needed to have been identified by their parents as having a current diagnosis or have received a diagnosis by a medical professional. And that could have been at any time between all three waves. So after they reevaluated based on all of those other factors to get the most similar children to really focus on the variable at hand, they came down to 176 children out of those initial 8,000 and 88 of those had autism spectrum disorder and the other 88 were neurotypical. So the children with autism spectrum disorder at wave two, their parents did have to report information regarding their presence of an intellectual disability and the number of services they received, whether that be occupational therapy, psychiatry, physical therapy, school resources, special needs assistance, anything like that to get a further understanding of the severity of their autism spectrum disorder. So the survey was given to the children and guardians in a scale format. So each question for each subject, the moderate to vigorous, the light activity and the screen time would all be given in the same question like format. How many times in the past 14 days have you done activity hard enough to make you breathe heavy? Or how many times in the last 14 days have you spent watching TV? And the children would provide answers in a scale format. So one to two days, all the way to nine days or more. And this was consistent within all three waves for each topic. So this first chart just shows the chi-squared values for participation in moderate to vigorous physical activity, wave one, two, and three. And this is the scale of none, so no moderate to vigorous physical activity all the way to nine or more hours. And as you can see with age, the p-value decreases, becoming more statistically significant. So all children, those with autism and those without autism, they both can be seen decreasing their amounts of moderate to vigorous physical activity with age. However, children with autism spectrum disorder do so on a higher scale, but they also participated in less moderate to vigorous physical activity at wave one compared to youth who are neurotypical. So these changes do not really suggest anything that would cause a comorbidity or changes that are that statistically significant enough to cause health risks later in life. This is a graph showing the same thing. So this is moderate to vigorous to light physical activity. This is showing the screen time and the screen time for video games. This is showing wave one, two, and three. And like you can see, the trends for children with autism are the same as the children who are neurotypical for each graph. Uh, while children with autism may be a little bit lower for physical activity, and they might be a tiny bit higher for screen time values, the trends are the same between each wave. And this last graph just gives you a look at the status of autism children related to the wave three outcome for the previous time points. So this is showing between wave one, two, and three, how they changed their values based on sex, age, and adjusted income to get to the values that they did. So the the study concluded that over time, children with autism participated in significantly less amounts of physical activity compared to normal children. And the what needs to happen in order to increase the amount of physical activity that children with autism participate in is education of physical well-being and more opportunity for children to have chances to participate in physical activity, whether that be at school, um, in extracurricular activities that are only for children like them so they feel more comfortable so that they learn more about their bodies and more about what exercise does and means to them. And into the critiques. So like we said, autism is a spectrum disorder. So Dahlgren et al. does notify that this is an, a spectrum disorder. However, the children that were used in this study were not taken into consideration for their level of severity of autism spectrum disorder. They were placed in categories, diagnosis of autism and neurotypical. And this really changes a lot of the information because if some of the children 
were on the severe end of autism spectrum disorder and could not participate in games or speak or did not have the motor skills necessary, then this would make them unable to participate in physical activity, which would not be by choice. It would be health reasons. So this would be important. It's not a one size fits all. These children have different capabilities and that means different opportunities. Second critique is that it's self-reported data. So not only the children, but parents will also overestimate physical activity that their children spend time on and underestimate the screen time, um, whether they're too embarrassed to say it or they feel like they're being a bad parent or children will do that because they are insecure or they don't want to actually tell you the truth um, on how much they spend time on. So this may have also skewed the results as they did not tell the complete truth on their time spent doing each activity. And the last critique was physical activity levels were only broken into two categories, the light physical activity and moderate to vigorous. And this is important because the type of activity should be considered as well as intensity. Uh, ages of nine to 18, those are the ages that have the higher rates of intramural sports. And if you have a child with autism spectrum disorder, they will not be participating in intramural sports for a variety of reasons, but they do not have the social skills or the communicating skills, and they don't have the same opportunity. So their chances to get in that moderate to vigorous physical activity are lower than those who are neurotypical. So children with autism face barriers that do not allow for this. So I would like to acknowledge Dr. Kim and the rest of my research lab members um, and the Department of Exercise Science at Syracuse University. And thank you so much, I ask. And here are my references. And thank you.